So Jim Crutchfield is our guest spot for this unit. He's professor of physics at University of California at Davis and director of the Complexity Science Center. He's also external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Jim is one of the pioneers in the field of chaos theory and has worked for many years on a variety of topics in complexity research, especially with respect to information processing in complex systems. So welcome, Jim. Hi, Melanie. How are you doing? I'm good. I'll just ask you, what do you think is the role of information, the concept of information, in understanding complex systems? Well, the short, simple answer is it's absolutely a key concept. Um, one of the uh, uh, important roles that it plays is, it, in some sense, it's a stand-in for the quantities that we're interested in. And the, the contrast I, or parallel I would draw would be uh, in physics. Physics, the, the sort of dominant uh, object or concept or entity we're interested in is energy. Um, and certainly there are many uh, successful applications of more or less traditional physics, say uh, the physics of phase transitions to complex systems. But many of these complex systems, if we're thinking of social networks or uh, um, uh, human design systems, the internet, don't necessarily have a, an appropriate notion of energy. So information in many ways stands in for trying to describe how complex a, a complex system is, um, and various kinds of information processing and storage can be associated with how a system is organized. So it's, it's a key concept. Certainly um, Shannon's original notion of information as degree of surprise a degree of unpredictability of a system or how random a system is needs to be augmented. And so that's certainly a focus of a lot of my work is trying to delineate that there are many different kinds of information, not just Shannonian information, which is a, in the context of communication theory is a degree of surprise. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's talk about a particular example. We, we've talked, for instance, about ant colonies. Uh, so how, how do you think information would fit in there, and what are the different kinds of information? Well, the basic approach that we use is to start with Shannon's view of any kind of process or natural system or design system as a communication channel. Now, that concept can be applied in many, many different ways. So uh, at the most general level, we can think of any temporal process as a communication channel that communicates the past to the future. And we can apply that uh, communication picture to an ant colony. And there are many different levels at which it can be applied. So there is a notion of the organization of the nest, of what kinds of uh, social or uh, even architectural information are built into the um, social organization or to the nest structure itself. And all of those things uh, express, all those kinds of organization express a certain summary of the ants' past behavior that's important for them to survive and therefore live on into the future. Mm -hmm. We could also zoom in a little bit and ask, what is it that um, is being uh, communicated and how is it that the colony organizes around uh, certain tasks? So that would be a more uh, uh, individual level um, uh, maybe a food source shows up some distance away from the nest. Mm -hmm. How does that get communicated? How do the different populations of workers and forager ants shift over time in response to available resources? And we can talk about that and also in information terms, how much the informational structure of the colony changes in response to this new outside information coming in, how much memory is there, and so on. Mm -hmm. So is information... A, a real thing in the sense that like mass and energy are real things? Is it the same kind of uh, f physical quantity? We're still working on this. Basically, yes. Um, it's not uh, unhelpful to think back it's four or five hundred years to the first discussions of what energy was in the foundations of physics. In the 16th and 17th century, there was a lot of discussion about whether energy depended upon, kinetic energy depended upon the speed of an object or the square of the speed. And back then we can see that as a confusion between momentum and kinetic energy. Uh -huh. And I think it's, it's, we're in a sense in that same period of trying to understand, first of all, that there's not a unitary notion of information. There are different kinds of information that have different semantic contexts in different settings. So um, it's, uh, I think, 
the proof is in the pudding. Is it useful? Yes, there are many applications of this. We've been able to show that Information storage and processing is relevant to describing how emergent properties appear and can be quantitative about that, say, in pattern forming systems or nonlinear dynamical systems. So there are many arenas in mathematical physics and nonlinear dynamics where the concept is extremely useful and, um, and hopefully the range of applications will grow. And as that happens, our notion of information and the kinds of information will be enriched. So we've talked about defining complexity mm -hmm. in this course and how that's a difficult thing to do, uh, and people have different definitions. So how does information fit into your particular definition of complexity? Uh, being somewhat simple-minded, they're essentially synonymous <laughs> in my But not view. Shannon information. Well, okay, so, so um, right. There is the mathematical definition of Shannon information, which is, to say it just most simply, tells one how much information there is in the occurrence of probabilistic events. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, it is really just how flat the probability distribution is, how uniform it is over mm -hmm. uh, uh, the events. That same mathematical structure gets used again and again, but the distributions that we're describing um, change depending upon the context of application. And for example, you can talk about um, the Shannon information in the causal architecture of a system. And that measures the amount of stored memory, not how difficult that system is to predict. So by causal architecture, you mean sort of what causes what in the system? Right. How many active degrees of freedom? If I look at a turbulent fluid or my you know, car's engine is idling roughly, how many active degrees of freedom are there? What's the, uh, wh where's, how much in the instantaneous state of the system um, is, is uh, storing the past information? What's the loci of information storage? And that's, we still use the same mathematical form, Shannon's, uh, uh, Shannon's uh, information function, but it's applied to a different distribution, and therefore the meaning of that kind of information differs from his original notion of how much information an information source produces per unit time. Okay. Um, l let me ask, I, I know you, you uh, had a lot of influence on the um, field of chaos theory and dynamics early on. How did that lead you to your current interest in information and information processing? Well, in the, in the sort of history of nonlinear physics and nonlinear dynamics, um, one of the most important early steps was the uh, Russian mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov and his student Yasha Sinai. They borrowed Shannon's notion of information that Shannon introduced in the mid-40s to apply to uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. What they were interested in is if you have two different dynamical systems, they sort of knew intuitively that they were chaotic or uh, in different degrees, and they were more or less unpredictable, but they weren't able to be quantitative until they borrowed Shannon's notion of information, taking his concept of source entropy rate and defining what's now called the Komogora Sinai entropy. So I have a nonlinear chaotic system set of deterministic differential equations, and I can now measure this information production rate, and I can say one system is more chaotic than the other, more difficult to predict than the other. So okay. the, the direct historical answer is in studying nonlinear dynamical systems, in particular those that are chaotic, information ha has a long half a century uh, uh, old history uh, in, in the very basic way we understand the production of information in natural systems. Okay. And w what are you working on now? What's like the most exciting thing that's got your attention? I contrasted uh, information, our notions of information, with uh, the earlier period of trying to understand what energy is. So I'd say the most uh, uh, engrossing thing right now is to ask, is there a fundamental relationship in a natural system that has different kinds of energy and is behaving over time, and how that is related to the system's information production, information storage. So the, the question here is, are there fundamental limits on the uh, amount of information processing you can extract from a natural system or a design system like a computer, and how much energy dissipation is required? So it's a new field now called information thermodynamics. We're actually trying to understand the direct relationship between energy and information. Interesting. So Liz Bradley, we talked to her in the last unit, uh, she talked about 
looking at as at computers as dynamical systems right. and measuring them in terms of those terms. Is that related to the kind of stuff you're looking at? Yes. Well, Liz and I are actually talking about taking some of uh, our measures of information storage and processing and applying that to simple kinds of logic circuits and seeing if and, and their physical implementation to see if there's some relationship between the degree of information processing and energy dissipation. The basic ideas, though, go back uh, to uh, Rolf Landau at IBM Research. Rolf just uh, passed away, and he had this notion now in, enshrined in uh, Landauer's principle that says for every bit of logical manipulation that a system does, you have to dissipate an amount of energy that's proportional to the number of bits. It's KT mm -hmm. log the number of, of, of uh, choices the system has to make in its logical operations. And that be, he claimed that that's a fundamental limit. So people are now testing this idea. Uh, one arena that uh, is being revisited is the notion of, of uh, Maxwell's demon. Maxwell introduced his clever little demon to sort fast and slow molecules into different sides of a box, thereby increasing the temperature difference and allowing for work to be extracted. Mm -hmm. And so there's a notion of how intelligent is a demon to extract how much work. So we're revisiting that, and that's sort of one prototype system that lets us talk about intelligence or information processing on the one hand, and energy dissipation and work extraction on the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. One last question. Um, a lot of students have asked uh, about how it is that somebody gets into complex systems research, you know, and there's no way you can major in complex systems in most universities. So what would you recommend for students who are really interested in getting into this field? Well, I guess they should take your online course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, um, I'm putting up my course now, and I, I suspect, given the, uh, the conversations about exactly this topic of massively online, massively open online courses, um, uh, it, it might be coming easier and easier to do that. Um, it is a little tough. Um, you know, there are certain basic areas, I think, that one should study. You know, and I, I have my own favorite lists, you know, statistical physics, information theory, the theory of computation and nonlinear dynamics. Um, you know, there's, there's a kind of... I gave a list like that, except mine included uh, lear learning, uh, evolution learning. Right, right. Well, I, I see those as applications of the basics, so. <laughs> but you're right, other kinds of systems, uh, certainly in all the questions about information storage and processing, even energy dissipation, uh, apply to ecological and learning systems, adaptive systems, and, uh, and uh, evolutionary systems, too. So, um, yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, th those should also would constitute some basic complex system itinerary. Hopefully, at some point in the future, although I don't think it's been realized, as you pointed out, there's a particular university that stepped forward and allowed something like a graduate program in complex systems. So the result is you have to be kind of adventurous. There's no shortage of popular and semi-popular, even kind of research monograph books out there. So maybe you know your course will provide a list of resources like that. But it's still we have to cobble these things together. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. I really appreciate it. Sure. Happy to help. Okay.